Today, our speakers are going to be talking about what affects us right now, which is high inflation, high interest rates, and well, how do we invest in that type of environment? A nationally recognized expert, Richard Del Monte, has been featured on Fox Business News, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, Private Opportunities Club, Private Wealth Management Magazine, um, Trusts and Estates, and the Family Wealth Report. Uh, he is also the author of Endless Inheritance, Moving from Feuding to Flourishing in Your Affluent Family. Richard holds an MBA in financial planning from Golden Gate University in San Francisco and a BS in business administration from Cal State Chico. He's been a faculty member at the Institute for Preparing Heirs, a student of Bowen Family Systems, and a founding member of the Council for Shared Leadership, which established standards of excellence for values-based advisors and the families they serve. Angela Wright has been advising families and, uh, since 2003. As partner and COO, her goal is to ensure that clients and employees are empowered and flourishing. She is driven to find out-of-the-box solutions that address client needs, whether it's related to finances or not. Angela earned a BS in business administration with an emphasis in financial services from Cal State Chico and an MBA from St. Mary's College in Moraga. She also holds the certified financial planner designation. She lives in the East Bay with her two young children. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Richard Del Monte. Thank you so much for having us. It is awesome to be back in person. As Joe mentioned, we're gonna talk about what's impacting us today. Um, we're gonna look at inflation, current interest rates, and what investors should and could be doing to help themselves in this environment. So uh, the current state of inflation and the recession, what is the Fed doing about it? Can we get out of this? We've got a bit of historical perspective, which I think is always fun. And then what can you do now as an investor? We'll leave plenty of time for questions, but if you have one, please just raise your hand and ask it. It's probably relevant to the entire group if it's top of mind for you. We are fiduciary investment advisors. We have a small boutique firm in Alamo and the lawyers make us put this disclaimer up. It basically says that talk to your advisor before you try implementing anything that we talk about here today and that all investments come with varying degrees of risk. If anybody wants to read that in more detail, you can still <laughs> yeah, I didn't yeah, put it in white yeah. on purpose. It's like one of those things at the, at the end of the radio ad, blah, 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 really fast. Basically, yeah. yeah. Right. So, okay, so let's start with inflation. It's all over the news, it's all over our minds, and it's all over our wallets. And I'm sure that everybody in this room has felt the squeeze in one way or another, whether you've tried to take out a loan to do some work on your home, buy a steak at the grocery store, oh. fill up your gas tank. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they got me to uh, do, do a chili cook-off for my kids' fundraiser. So I go into Lunardi's and I buy a, you know, a five pound, four, pork shoulder and they say, okay, that'll be the first mortgage on your house, please. <laughs> it's like 50 bucks for this thing. It's just, yeah. you know, it's really incredible. And I make jokes, but it is a frightening thing when you're on a fixed income. How are you supposed to make those dollars stretch? You know, you did your plan when interest rates were 3%. Now we've got inflation hanging out at 8%. Yep. So yep. chart here shows you where we are currently with inflation. So you're looking at the last 50 years from 1972 across. And, and the blue line is, is the consumer price index, which is our measure of inflation. And just look at the last 40 years here. There's this long span of like three, four percent inflation. We've become really used to that. And isn't it shocking suddenly to see, ah, you know, we're up here at eight percent as of August 2022. Who remembers the high rates in, this, in the early 80s? Remember the money market rates? I remember B of A, the money market rate was 20 percent. I couldn't believe it, you know, yeah. just crazy. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So, you know, we're, we, four percent is about what, what we would consider normal 
Uh, the powers that be are shooting for 2.5% as our baseline inflation. That's what they would like to do. And you can see here we're a bit off the map yep. currently. So far, yeah. So what's so, driving it? Yeah, so let's, we want to talk a little bit about what creates inflation. And basically, what drives prices up of anything is really an imbalance in supply and demand. So, for example, if you're trying to buy, what, uh, natural gas right now, and you're in Europe, okay, <laughs> and there's not as much natural gas available, the price has to go up to be able to equalize that and create equilibrium. The same thing happens in, with, with respect to money supply in the United States. So if there's a lot of money pumped into the economic system, and there's not enough places to spend it, then the price of the things you want to buy are going to go up. So that happened during the pandemic. The government pumped in uh, you know, trillions and trillions of dollars into the economy in, with the forms of stimulus and uh, unemployment benefits and benefits for businesses and all kinds of things, just unprecedented amounts of money. And it was all there, and now it has to get spent. Um, and so it's just driving the prices of everything up. And that, what ends up happening from that is when the prices of airline goes up, airline uh, tr tickets and cars and all that stuff, then all of a sudden workers have to earn more. They start demanding more from their employers. And then the employers go, oh my gosh, we have to raise prices. Our costs are going up. And then you create this vicious cycle in the economy. And we're seeing that now with every different segment is actually wanting higher and higher prices to be able to, to keep up with inflation. And if you look at the next slide, um, we look at the top, the number one, two, and three drivers of inflation so far have been shelter. We know how much houses, real estate has gone up in the last couple of years. And then we've got energy. Primarily, the energy is in the form of natural gas going up. A lot has to do with what's happening in Ukraine, right? And then cars. They ran out of chips in the later part of the, of the pandemic. It wasn't enough cars to buy, that drove up prices, and, and also they're switching over to EVs and things like that, so the prices have gone way up. But again, it's filtered into the whole rest of the economy. So what is the Fed going to do about this? Well, as you've heard on the news, they're going to raise interest rates. It's one of the best tools that they have to combat inflation. And it makes sense, right? If we raise rates, both people and companies can borrow less which means they can spend less. And the easiest example to look at is housing. If we suddenly jack up the mortgage rates, you can't buy as much house anymore. So they raise interest rates and it puts a bit of a squeeze on the economy and it forces us to contract. And this is the history of uh, our, the federal interest rate from uh, 2000 to today. So we're sitting at just above 3% today, not completely out of this world in terms of interest rates on the whole, but you know, recency bias, it seems really high to us today because we've been hanging out at nothing, right? And then at the end of the chart, yep. you can see the, uh, the projections of what the Fed thinks they're going to do going forward. And I think this is really great because we tend to assume that once something starts, it's just going to keep going that way forever. And so people are kind of fearful, like, well, where does it end? We're just going to keep going. 20%. <laughs> but no. in reality, you know, they're shooting for this 2.5%. And they suspect that by the end of next year, we may actually get to drop rates again just a bit. We will have contracted the economy enough. Not terrible news on the interest rate front. So wrong answers only. Does anyone know the difference between a recession and a depression? No? <laughs> All right, A recession us. is when my neighbor loses his job. A depression is when I lose my job. <laughs> <laughs> right. But no, let's talk. So recession has been all over the news. Where it's looming, it's coming. We've got two quarters down in GDP growth. But the real difference, you know, between a recession and depression, of course, is a recession is typically shallower drops in the economic growth measured by gross domestic product, GDP, and it's for a shorter period of time. A depression is much deeper uh, losses in GDP over a, a more extended period of time, usually a number of years. Yeah. yeah. So looking at a bit of hi historical perspective, I think most of you in this room will remember everything that we're talking about here, but it's nice to keep it in mind when you're looking at what's happening now and, and what's to happen going forward, because we can really get in our heads about it. So we have survived 19 noteworthy recessions since we started tracking these things. Before the 20th century, the recessions were usually driven by one of three things, catastrophic business failure, embezzlement, or excessive land speculation. So basically malfeasance. <laughs> it was the know, Wild West, part of, truly. Yeah, speculated, the robber barons and things like that. 
causing yeah. problems. Yeah. yeah. And right. so, you know, the hallmark was the, the federal government had no tools. There was nothing they could do about this. And these three things led to the founding of the National Central Bank. And once we founded that, our recessions became more tolerable, I managed would say. Managed better. They started to be managed, yeah. 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 Um, so the average recession before 2007, it's just 11 months. It seems like they go on and on and on, but it, they're not that long, actually. Our longest recession was the Great Recession, the financial crisis, the housing crisis, the bank bailout, whatever you want to call it, the 08-09 period. Yep. Shortest was the pandemic, two months. But boy, wasn't that the scariest one? Because not only did we deep. have economic failure, immediate, but yeah. we all had you know, a risk to our lives. Economy shut down, it was really deep, yeah, for sure. So this is interesting. We call the market a leading indicator. This is the financial forum, so you may know this. The reason is it usually starts to recover about six months before the, ec the economy overall recovers. So if we're in the middle of a recession, you can kind of look at what the stock market's doing. What are people expecting corporations to do going forward? And it'll often tell us a recovery is on the way. Yep, that happened in 2009, like in the middle of March, the market bottomed and started going high really quickly in, in 2009. And the recession had, was still playing out, mm -hmm. but the market was already recovering, anticipating the next up phase in yeah. the market. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the reality of recessions versus what the media portrays recessions to be like. If you listen to the media, they make it like, like that. <laughs> recession, oh my gosh, it's like the end of the world. What, what's it gonna, it's gotta be bad if they keep talking about it and we, are we gonna dip into one or not? This is what they make it seem like, you know? <laughs> but in, the reality of a recession, let's look at that. We can look at it graphically. These are every quarter going back to the 1950s in the United States showing economic growth or gross domestic product quarter by quarter. And the blue quarters are the ones when the, when the economy increases. The little tiny gray ones that drop you know, a little bit, uh, around three to 4% at the most for brief periods of time, those are the recessions. Those are the times when the economy receded. So they're kind of minuscule compared to the growth. And if the next slide will actually show you in a, in a, in a different context, here they are, try to point out the ones where the economy dropped. I mean, you can see them, they're in there, but the trend is going up. And to point them out, a recession out like, it's the end of the world. It's not, it's not the end of the world. It's like a bad rainy day, mm -hmm. you know, in, in living in California. The recessions are, if you just look at them in context, they're not that bad. And as you say, they're necessary, Well, right? they're a normal part of the business cycle. Right. Just harken back to Econ 101 for me for a moment. You have your expansion, you have a peak, you have a recession and a trough. In order to maintain our capitalist economy, th right. you have to go through these business cycles. It's a necessary correction. We ha sometimes we things get out of hand in one area or another, and we need to pull back and correct. Yeah. And it leaves space for growth in other areas. Right. So I'm arguing that they're, they're necessary. They are necessary. As much as they Absolutely are. they are, yeah. This is a good one, go ahead. Yeah, okay, so I love this chart because it shows us a history of the returns of the S&P 500 index going all the way back to the 20s. So we've got almost 100 years of data on this chart now. The yellow lines are showing you bull markets, up markets, and the red ones are the bear markets. And now I'm sure some of you can remember being in the middle of some of these bear markets. Here we have the pandemic. Right? Oh gosh, it looks like nothing on this slide, but how awful was that period? Or here you have you know, 15 months combined, 08, 09, where you couldn't find a return anywhere. You couldn't get it in bonds. You couldn't get it in the stock market. Um, the dot-com burst, these are just our most recent examples. You've got the Great Depression down here. But look at this in this context, how minuscule are those? Right, you've got the markets down, let's say, 51% over the period of 13 months. Over the next 131 months, they're up 500%. Back here, in the late 80s, you've got three months, the market goes down 30%. Over the next 150 months, they go up 817%. So this cycle that we're in helps build the returns in the market. And the other point is they're short and brief. They're not anything to be terrorized about. Yeah. They don't last. The markets recover always, at least historically. <laughs> yeah. And so that leads us to a bit of good news because you would think we'd be looking at a recession. We've had two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. But the reality is a recession encompasses a lot more. 
like loss of jobs, loss of corporate profits. And we've got some good news here. Unemployment is still at an all-time low. We've got two jobs for every one worker. So if your grandkids don't have a job, get them out of the house, because there is one for them. Corporate profits are holding up much better than expected. This was really interesting yep. as we dug into the data. You wouldn't expect this if you listen to the media. Of course not. But this is what it looks like. This shows the history of corporate profits going back till 1988, and the blue bars are what they expect the corporate profits to be in the next two or three years, higher than ever. So why are we freaking out? Right. You know, I mean, the economy is going to grow, corporate profits are going to grow. And if that's the case, that means the stock market will do okay. This is the consensus of all the uh, economists and people that, that do the, those yeah. kind of things. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, we really believe in the soft landing theory here. And if we do see a pullback in corporate profits, which it's, it stands to reason sure we could. Sure, we will. We're sure we will. Yeah. Our recession will be mild if we have one at all. The other piece of good news is that guaranteed interest rates are the highest in a generation. I have not, I've been in financial services for 20 years now, and I have not seen rates this high ever. I've never steered a client towards a treasury bond, you know, because yep. you just couldn't yep. get the return. And yep. now you can, and we'll show you some more yep. rates. And of course, recessions, as you just saw, are temporary. So that's a little bit of where we are, history of recessions. So now what is an investor supposed to do? Just tell us what to do, guys. You've got your preemptive strike. How do you set yourself up to weather these storms? Because as you saw, we know they're coming. So ignoring them is like, you know, doing the ostrich theory. Put your head <laughs> in the sand. Don't do that. You're, they're coming. And then what do you do once markets are down? Right? We're all sitting here in this situation right now. So we have some ideas. So the preemptive strike is your goal is to withstand and benefit from inflationary periods that you know are coming. So on the fixed income side of your portfolio, we want to hold short term fixed income for up to five years of draws. What the heck does that mean? You're living, most of you, on a fixed income. Some of you are pulling that out of an investment portfolio. You've got some stocks in that portfolio, and you've got fixed income, like cash, CDs, money market, and bonds. If you could set yourself up to pull your draws from that fixed income for a five-year period, you'd be able to withstand any gyrations in the stock market so long as certain percentages remain in that fixed income. Five years of your draws. And then you can listen to people like us who are up on the stage saying, oh, wait it out, you've got time. I know it doesn't feel like you've got time. Yeah, it feels scary. Yeah, yeah. but when you give, you give yourself options by having money in fixed income. But the main thing is to structure your portfolio so you're not having to sell stocks when they're down to live on. That's key. Yes. Yeah. No more than 70% equities for anybody who's retired unless your income is 100% secure. Um, and so that's a big generalization, obviously. But in general, we find that when you're going over 70% in equities, you're not leaving enough to sustain your draws for five years. You're probably a bit overexposed in the markets, and you'll, you're, you'll find yourself more afraid in times like now. Yep. And you have a higher odds of having a catastrophic loss and losing income. All right. No more than 10% in any one security in your portfolio. We see this all the time, especially in this area. We have lots of clients who retire out of big corporations. You've got your Oracle people. You've got your AT&T. Uh, all the techies. Yeah. 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 And, you know, I had an experience where people, people tend, to, they, they tend to become emotionally attached to their stocks. Uh, you may have felt this yourself, but if they work for the company, they get emotionally attached. You go, oh, I feel like this company is safe. And I've had people do that with Nike stock. And the most extreme example I can share with you was uh, a guy who owned, he worked for Enron. Okay, remember Enron back in the day? Um, one of the big, biggest you know, scam companies that ever was. And he had all of his 401k was in Enron. He owned, he owned uh, shares that he bought from them. And his job, his pension came from them and his job I mean, his, uh, you know, his, his work, he worked there. His income. So I said, you need, he had like 80% of his portfolio in Enron. I said, you've got to you know, get this thing narrowed down to 10%. He said, oh, no, the company, the projections is going to go crazy, crazy. He goes on vacation. He goes on a sabbatical to Italy for six weeks. When he comes back, no more Enron, no more 401k. His balance was zero, and he had no more stock options, and he basically had to start over, and no job. So he had to start over completely from scratch. It's not worth that kind of risk to take the risk of one particular company 
having a problem. And the blue chips from before, you know, we could say the same thing. Well, you know, you might feel that way about Apple today. What else? You know. Well, we see this. Yeah, Google. you've got Amazon, Google. They're unstoppable. Yeah. They're yeah, the they're darlings. Great. People felt the same thing about, you know, Eastman Kodak 30 years ago. You know, you just, you just don't know. There's yeah. cycles. It's a thing to avoid because you're taking unnecessary risk. And I think yep. we often see it too in folks that have what I would call a legacy portfolio. Dad set this portfolio up back in the day when there were no mutual funds and you only had yep. you know, a pool of 10 stocks to choose from. Well, my dad did really well in this portfolio because he chose IBM and GE. Whatever, you know? yeah. um, and so Chevron. you're still maybe hanging on to some of that. Well, the reality is you just don't know which one is going to be the next one. Yeah. And so having more than 10% in any one position is not. Yep. And it's interesting because one guy was, one guy that I talked to was all enamored with the Chevron stock, which he inherited from his father. And he said, oh, this thing has done so great for me, the dividends and everything. Well, I showed him how Chevron has done compared to the S&P 500 over the last 30 years. And he was appalled because it, it hasn't kept up. Yeah. It just hasn't. So you, it's not worth it. And then we just said no more than 70% in equities. And now I'm going to say no less than 40% in equities. These You're are generalizations. Saying, make up your mind, people. Well, this is to help you keep pace with inflation, which is now more obvious than ever. When I first started out and we had no inflation, I would have to tell people, you got to invest in stocks. Why? Why would I want to do There's no, you can't set my inflation at 3% on my financial plan. It's never going to be that high. That's ridiculous. Here we yeah. are. And yeah. so get, you know, investing in stocks is one of the best ways to hedge yourself against inflation overall. It's why we exist. Right, because stocks do 10, 11% a year and inflation is three or four. So yeah. even though you're retired, even though you're on a fixed income, you still want to have some of your assets in equities. And the formula for you depends on your draws, how stable is your income, and then also in your guts, how much volatility you can tolerate. Because yeah. there is a, a right answer, I'll say. There's an ideal mix. Yeah. But if you wake up every morning and go straight to CNBC and you look at your portfolio and you feel the pit in your stomach, that's not worth it. That's damaging yeah. the quality of, of your life. And one thing I'll say is, don't watch CNBC if that's what you're doing, because <laughs> that is investment pornography. I'm telling you, there's it's nothing true. redeeming in watching the stock market go up or down on a daily basis, because all it does is make you feel emotional and yes. to do things that you shouldn't otherwise do. Yeah. It's not, the, the, what's happening today or next week in the stock market is not germane to your long-term financial health. You don't need to know. You need to know <laughs> that you need to be in the markets and trust that, that the U.S. economy is going to be a, a generator of wealth over the long run. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay, so we talked about how to set yourself up. If you didn't do those things, that's okay. It's not too late. What do you do when things are down? So the first thing is respond without emotion and recover. Easier said than done. I, I can't Angela. emphasize those first yeah. three words enough. Yeah. Respond yeah. without emotion. Yep. Um, don't panic and sell while you're down. This is like so incredibly common that this guy Carl Richards made a chart about it. So you can see the economic cycle. I was just talking about markets go up, everybody gets really greedy. My neighbor made 20% his Apple stock. I got to get into that Apple stock. You buy some and then it goes down. We all sell out of it because we're terrified. Repeat until broke, as Carl says. Yeah. <laughs> That's what happens. What about Mr. Davis? People. Yeah, so I had a guy that uh, during the, the pandemic, the market lost about 38% during the pandemic in a very short period of time. And so this one client, we had one client who he couldn't take it. You know, he just saw his stock portfolio was losing money. And he said, you got to get me out. I'm like, please don't do this. This is a mistake. I, got, I can't sleep. I can't do it. So he got out. And then when the market recovered really fast, you know, as you probably remember, in the latter part of 2020, he, he always thought it was a head fake. He didn't get back in. And so because he took him the whole rest of the year before he started getting back in, he lost a million dollars in his portfolio and it was permanent. And he said, well, I know that I lost money, but I sure slept good. I'm like, I hope so. Because <laughs> you paid about a million dollars for those, those nights of sleep you were getting. You know, so it's, you just yeah. don't, this is a bad, this is something to be aware of. Yeah. You know, and not fall victim to it. All right, learn the difference between a forecast and an opinion. What you're seeing on CNBC or uh, what's his name, the loud guy? Kramer. Jim Kramer. Kramer these, are, yeah. these are opinions not often rooted in fundamental analysis. But there are lots of forecasts that you can get out there that rely on decades of data. Uh, and they're really, really good. So just, you know, but we're asking, I guess, for you to be discerning when you're looking at yeah. 
And the stuff you see on TV, you have to understand it's for entertainment value, not for real, real, you know, advice. Because the guys they have on there, if they had people coming on CNBC saying, don't worry about it, it's temporary, it'll be over with. Nobody would watch anymore. (laughs) Instead, what they have is guys on, oh my gosh, it's going to go down 20%. I know it, you know, and all these dire predictions. That's, that's, those are the people they put on. Yeah. And, you know, and it's just... It's not useful. I have a friend who's a, who is a journalism major, and he taught me the phrase, if it doesn't bleed, it doesn't lead. <laughs> and now I think I like about that. that every time I'm watching the news. How much of this is blood? How much of this is real information that I need to know to make decisions for right. myself? Right. Rebalance when the markets are down. So we talked about having a set percentage of stocks and a set percentage of bonds. I'm really simplifying the concept here. But let's say you have a 50-50 portfolio. And then the stock market goes down 30%. This is your stock bucket. Whoop! Now your portfolio looks like this. And maybe your stocks are now 40% of your portfolio and your bonds are 60. But you're trying to keep that stock percentage at 50. So what you're going to do when the stocks are down is you're going to sell off some of your fixed income and you're going to put them into your bonds to rebound. Wait, rebalance. you want me to buy stocks when they're down? Are you Hello, crazy? what did the chart did I just show you? Yeah, yes. I get it. That's <laughs> I what do. you have to do. But that's right? a really hard thing to do in reality. When, like, th- Remember back to the pandemic when we, our portfolios were down and we thought we were going to perish. You're like, going to go put more money in the stock market at that back, point? Yeah, back in 2009 when this, when this was going on, uh, we were rebalancing people and buying more stocks when they were down. I did it for my mom. She called me up. What are you doing buying more stocks? I'm like, Mom, the markets are down. You know, this is what's happening. I'm calling the police on you. <laughs> she really is, don't you know the, the stock market's going to zero? I'm like, Mom. And, you know, I said, Mom, no one's ever said they were going to call the police on me. And you're my mom, you know, but she just was so emotional. You know, <laughs> it was understandable. You know? So I've heard this a few times. And I think probably this is the financial forum. So maybe, maybe you know better. But... A lot of people will say, well, can, I, can my stocks go down to zero? Yeah. If you hold two or three companies, maybe. <clears throat> Unlikely, but maybe, right? Enron went to zero. Eastman Kodak went to zero. That could happen. Yeah. If you're diversified, that would basically mean the fall of capitalism as we know it for your stocks to go down to zero. So keep that in mind as you're watching things yeah. fall. The biggest declines we ever see are around 50%, and they're temporary. So you know it's not going to go to zero if you do the right percentages that we talked about. Yep. Okay, number four, harvest losses in taxable accounts. What does that mean? That means take your things that are temporarily down in value, below what you paid for them, sell them, and buy something very similar to that, almost identical. You can sell an S&P 500 fund and buy another, you know, uh, large cap fund that's similar to that. And you can take the loss, and then when the markets come back, you're still in the market. You're yes. not out. Yeah. So that's a good way. You can actually create, it's a way of ch- making chicken pie out of chicken something else, you know. <laughs> and, and so you can make, you know, if you save, if you can book a $10,000 loss, that'll save you an, over, at some point, you know, maybe $2,500 of taxes. So it's worth it. Only make allocation changes if there's a fundamental shift in risk tolerance. So this is Mr. That doesn't mean you got scared. No, right? yeah. so yeah. Mr. Davis calls up. That's not a, he's afraid because of what's going on in the market. That's not a fundamental shift in his investment objective or his risk tolerance. Right. And so if you're in one of those moments, our advice is wait for it to come back, then make the fundamental shift, not while it's down, unless right. something catastrophic has happened to you, which again, fundamental shift. You've lost an income stream. More than like likely, that. the fundamental shift will have gone away because you'll feel more confident when the markets are back. Yeah. And then basically, whatever your gut tells you to do, do the opposite. This is the most key thing you're going to get out of this whole, other than the sandwiches, this is the best thing you're going to get out of this whole presentation. Whatever your gut tells you to do, do the opposite, and you will make so much money. You will be so successful, right? Well, and here's why. I have a series of charts illustrating just how stupid as a people we are. You ready for this? All right. (laughs) What we're looking at here is consumer confidence by political affiliation. We're walking a fine line here, I know. But so uh, the Republican leaning folks are in the red, the Democrats are in the blue, as always. And this chart is showing you how confident they are in the economy over a period of time. So we're going back to 2000. And you notice, like January 1 through 09, this is the Bush era, right? George W. Bush. George yeah. W. Um, Republicans super confident in their guy, Democrats maybe not so much. And we lost 4.5% during that period. But we're so confident. It's going to be so great. 
Here you have 09 through 17. The Obama years, yeah. The Obama years, nobody's happy. Oh my gosh, we're, we're miserable, right? And during this period, we earn, sorry, the thing Stock I market? Can't really see, 16% yeah. during that period, right? So we let our political affiliations drive our thoughts about what's gonna happen in the economy and, and they do this to us, right? They get up on stage and they say, well, I'm gonna fix the economy. Well, buddy, it's not really broken. And you're not the puppet master that's driving that. Yeah. Um, and, and we're wrong every time. You know, you know most people think of the economy like with the president is like the pilot of an aircraft, you know, of a jet airliner, and he controls everything. The, the president, Congress, they have some impact. They're players in the economy. But you and I all collectively have as much impact as some of these other factors. What really drives the economy is, are we comfortable, are we confident enough to go buy another car or another house or spend money, go on vacations, do these things that we would normally do, or are we holding back? Those are the, those are the things that really impact how well the economy does. This shows the uh, economy going back to 1926 and economic growth, and, or the stock market, sorry, and then the parties, the red is the, is the Republicans in holding Congress, and the blue is the Democrats holding Congress. And most people say, I don't want to, you know, people have told me so many, but, uh, George W. Bush can be president, get me out. Trump's the president, get me out. You know, Obama, I can't, that guy's going to ruin the economy. Now we're hearing about Biden, you know. But if you look at this, there's no reality to that. You couldn't tell me, we could flip these red and blues, and you would, it would be about the same. There's really not much data. There's no direct impact on who controls Congress. So if you're thinking about, you know, holding back on your investments based on who wins the election in a week or two, it's a, don't do that. It's, or you're not basing related. your vote in the election right. on what you think they're going to do for the economy. Right. So what really matters is it's not the political party. It is corporate profits. Again, the, the, if, you, if you could superimpose the stock market on top of this chart, and it would almost follow exactly. Um, so if corporate profits are going to go up in the future, then the stock market will do better. There's, it's, that's the best I can tell you. It's not about the other factors. They all work, you know, Ukraine, the invasion of Ukraine, it really knocked the stock market down for a period of time. If something big happens in Ukraine now, the stock market is just gonna yawn. Big things that happen in news events, they do have an impact for a short period of time. It's not lasting. I think an important point to expand on that is that the market's like expected things to happen, right? The yeah. markets have expectations and they, what they don't like is being surprised. If, this, yeah. if the stock market was an animal, you know, don't sneak up on it and surprise it. But when we know, like now we expect, you know, there to be uh, a natural gas and wheat issues in Europe. And once it's baked into the expectation, you can already see it reflected in the returns of the yeah. stock market. So if you know something, by the time it gets to us in this room, it's already baked into the returns on yeah, the market. For sure. This is a personal favorite of mine. Let me orient <laughs> you on this chart. You are looking at about 50 years of stock market returns. The uh, blue dots on the returns are showing you consumer sentiment, high and lows. So above the dotted blue line, you're seeing all of the highs. We are so high on this economy. We love it. It's great. Yes, invest more. And then down here, you're seeing all of the lows. Oh, man, this is the worst it's ever been. It's going to continue being terrible. This is a terrible economy. So what do you notice about this chart? Each time we hit a low, the stock market immediately recovers. It's like the next day it starts to recover. Uh, so here you are like August 2011, right? We think, oh my gosh, everything's horrible. Consumer sentiment is at 60% you know, or so. And then the markets go up 15% in the months that follow. And here we are, oh, February of 2020. Oh, things are great, woohoo! No, they're not. We tank immediately after that. Yeah. So what I take from this is we are all wrong and we need to do the opposite of what we think in our guts we should be doing. Yeah. We were wrong every time. Or another way to say it is when consumer confidence is in the toilet, buy stocks as fast as you can. <laughs> because you're probably going to yeah. end up in a year making a lot more money. But this is a good example of when we said don't trust your gut. People's guts are dead wrong. Sorry. If they followed it, they, the next 12 months would have, would have gotten the exact opposite returns that they were expecting. All right, so 
getting back to why investors are terrible and stupid. <laughs> We've got, uh, pay attention to the bottom chart here. What you're seeing is investment returns over the last 20 years by asset class. So here you have the S&P 500 has given us about 9.5%. That's like if you put it in a Vanguard S&P fund and didn't touch it all this time. Rip Van Winkle approach. Go to sleep, <laughs> wake up in 20 years. 9.5. If you <laughs> had one of those 60% stock, 40% bond portfolios, you probably got about 7.4%. All the way down here, we have Joe Investor sitting at 3.6%. Why is Joe doing so poorly? He's reacting to his emotions. <laughs> Thanks, Richard. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so what's happening is his behavior. It's the timing that he's trading in and out. It's the positions that he's purchasing. He's just making bad guesses. It's also how he's coming in and out. So you have two, two factors into an overall return. You have the investments return, and then you have the investor return, and the difference is in the behavior. So what this is illustrating here is that if you just sat back in a diversified portfolio, you'd be sitting pretty at 7.4 percent. And just left with your it. emotions out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And so back to Mr. Davis, right? Yep. People say, "Oh, just get me out of the market." Or I have another fellow Bob. We'll call him. He calls me and he says, "Well, I just inherited a couple hundred thousand. My wife unfortunately passed away, and um, but I'm going to wait till the market calms down to invest that." And I said, okay, Bob, well, how will you know the market's calmed down? Well, you know, there won't be so much in the news about it. Okay, that's never going to happen. Um, and, and, you know, it's like stocks won't be so volatile. I said, do you mean they'll be back up? Yeah. Well, how high should we go before we buy back in? I don't know. So basically, Bob, poor Bob, is telling me buy when the markets go back up. And here's the thing, and the reason why Mr. Davis from before lost a million dollars. It's easy to decide when to get out. It's hard to decide when to get back in. Because if you were invested every day in the stock market uh, from 2006 until the end of 2021. And 06 includes that gigantic recession. And the pandemic. You know, and the pandemic recession, right. So you would have... Uh, you would have averaged 10.6% annually during that period. So All it, the ups and downs and terrible so things. So $10,000 like grew 4.5 times. Yeah. 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 If you miss the 10 best days in the market, you cut your return in half. More than half, yeah. And if you miss the 40 best days, so you're out, Mr. Davis was out almost a year. If you're out just over a month, you cut your return to 3.5%. So you lost 90% of your return by missing how many of those days? The 40, 40? the 40 best days. 40 best days. You lost 90% of your return. And now, who can tell me what the stock market has done over the last week? It's been great, right? Yeah. We're, have, we're in this period. We're having those best days. I'm not, I'm not certain we're going to keep going in that direction, but these are the best days that people are talking about. Had you waited to get back in, you would have completely missed the last week and a half in the markets. Yep. So stay in is the point. All right. All right. We're going to talk to you about current opportunities, what things you can do now based on the, uh, the markets being the way they are. First thing that is really great, as you probably all know, there's really great yields in treasuries. Now, if you have all your money at B of A or Wells Fargo or Chase, I can't help you because I know they're still paying 0.05%, but everywhere else is paying a lot of money on safe money. So treasuries, you could buy a one-year treasury and get 4.5%. The great thing about that is there's there no go. state income tax on treasuries. You can buy them direct. You can buy them through your broker. Um, you know, they're there. Look at the yields. Uh, so one year is 4.5, two years, 4.4. Going down even to six months is 4.5 almost. And three months is, is 4.1. Many money markets, like we look at the Schwab money markets, we work with Schwab, um, they're, they're paying more than 3% on their money markets. So those are great, great yields for savers now that weren't there uh, last year, this time last year, for sure. So recently, I've seen a couple of people come into the office with like a few hundred thousand it, it sitting in their savings account at Chase or Bank of America. If you're one of those people, the banks know, the brick and mortars know that they don't really have to match interest rates. You're just going to keep your money there yeah. by, by default because it's hard and complicated and whatever. But you can open an account at ally.com. So another FDIC insured bank up to 250000 you can put there. And every day I get an email from them that my rate is going up. So now I think I'm at 2.3%. In a savings account, I can open online, connect my checking account to it, and transfer money back and forth within two days. So 
get out of the, the brick and mortar banks and put your money in yeah. these other companies. And if you're socially responsible minded, a good alternative to Ally is called Aspiration Bank. Same situation, same FDIC insured bank, paying the same interest rate, but they re they're a B Corp and they reinvest only in socially responsible um, investments. And just for comparison's sake, if you could move from like a B of A or, or you know, Wells to one of these accounts at one of these online banks, um, you're, you're gonna get in one year the same amount that Wells would pay you in 50 years. So you can see the difference, it's just, it's astronomical. It's free money for the taking without any additional risk. One final thing to note on this, you're seeing the diff returns for three different assets, U.S. Treasuries, corporates, and municipals over various time periods. I think it's really interesting how corporate bonds are paying less than the guaranteed U.S. Treasury. So I would say if you're a, you're a big bond person right now, why take the risk here when you could be up here in, in the guaranteed yeah. treasuries with no state tax on That's your That's an unusual interest. condition, usually because corporates are riskier than the government. So you think that the yields would be higher, but they're not. Yeah. Okay, you wanna go with the I-bonds? Oh, we love our I-bonds, yeah. So you can put 10,000 right now uh, per person into I-bonds. Um, and so I-bonds are designed to help you hedge against inflation. The interest rate tracks the inflation rate. Um, but a lot of people don't know this. They think, oh, I'll buy a 30-year I-bond today at 9.6% and I'll get that 9.6% the entire if only. time. Yeah. yeah, if only. That's not true. They have a fixed rate, which is currently zero and then they have an inflation rate. That's where all the return is coming from, and they recalculate this every six months. So if you stay in this bond over 30 years, you're going to see a fluctuation in your interest rate that should help you keep pace with inflation. They're a great hedge. You can only put 10,000 a piece in, right. so I, I say go for mm -hmm. it, um, so but they will change, and you can sell them after you've held them for one year. Yeah. That's kind of your lock-in period. So if you buy it before November 1st, you get a 9.6% return for six months, after that, it's going to go to six point something, mm -hmm. six point three, I think. Yeah. She's got the numbers. For another six months. So it's not bad. Six months, you know, you're probably average eight percent, seven, eight percent. Could be worse. Okay, important thing to think about in a capitalist economy, companies want profits. They have shareholders to, and wives to answer to. And like, <laughs> you know, they got to make the money. So right now they're retooling. We saw them do this during the pandemic. Everyone moved home and suddenly the trains kept, for the most part, kept running on time. And, and you know, they're going to find a way to make lemonade out of any economic situation. So the best thing that you can do is invest now because companies are either going to retool to become more profitable or or they're just going to raise their prices, as we've seen. Yeah. People have been shocked. One of the reasons the markets are doing well is because they've been so resilient. Companies have generated profits that nobody thought they could do, you know, in, in the current economy. And they, but they're just, they're doing it because they're smart. They know how to make, they know how to make money. So they're not just like things that are sitting there doing nothing. There's people inside there that are working really hard and they're, you know, they're, they're trying to thrive whatever comes along. And you can bank on that continuing going forward. And you never want to underestimate American ingenuity and <laughs> search for profits because it's there. Okay, continuing our current opportunities. Uh, residential real estate, it's always a wonderful part of any investment portfolio or any retirement income plan. Um, but rents tend to go up during inflation. And if you're holding rental real estate, you might consider raising your rents. If you can't invest directly or you don't want to deal with being a landlord, you've got real estate um, investment trusts, REITs, that you can invest in, and they yep. should be doing well um, in the coming months. Uh, right now, we've got a bit of a standoff between buyers and sellers. So we've got buyers saying, hey, rates are up, reduce my price. And you've got the sellers clinging for dear life to the 2021 Wait, just worth a million dollars. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, uh, but we are seeing, you know, deals are taking longer to close, fewer offers. We're not shooting above asking with no contingencies anymore. Um, and so I suspect we'll continue to see some deals. And so people will say, well, I don't want to buy a house right now, especially if I have to get a loan, because let's pay so much on the loan. But what you can do is refinance the loan later. So it makes more sense. And we've run the math every which way on this. It almost always makes more sense to buy a house at a lower price with a higher interest rate than the reverse. Buy at a lower rate and a higher price. You can always refinance that yeah. mortgage later. And there are, there are great opportunities in other states for real estate that can be used for rental properties. They're a lot cheaper. We were, I was just up in Washington, and an average home there is like 450, 470, and they're renting for like $2,500 a month. 
you know, so the numbers work for those kind of things, yeah. yeah. And the other thing is, you know, people worry about what's going to happen to housing prices. Well, I don't know what's going to happen in the short run, but do you think that, I mean, they're, they're ultimately based on the price of land and the price of labor, you know, building, construction labor, and the price of materials. Anybody here think those things are going down in the future? I don't, you know, and so if, if, you, if you expect that materials and, and labor and land are going to go up in price, then you can expect the value of a home that you own will continue to increase over the long run, not, notwithstanding what might happen in the next year or so. Yeah. So I'm guessing someone in this room has gold or silver Under in their safe bed. in their home. No, Don't you're your smart hand. enough to put it in a safe. It's in a safe. <laughs> yeah. um, so traditionally, they were the favorites. And they're still an important part of an investment portfolio, but to dump all of your money over there because things are volatile in the stock market is not a good idea. And you get a lot of emotional trading in these things. Um, it's similar to what we're seeing with crypto right now, which I didn't even put it on the list because it's a speculation at this point and it should be a very small portion of your portfolio if you find it fun to play with that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but what you have now is young people, like in their 20s, are all hot on silver and gold. Like they think they discovered it. Sure. And I had this young you know, son of a client, oh, I'm, I've got silver, I'm buying all silver. They never That's heard of Howard <laughs> Ruff. <laughs> I mean, I get, yeah. you know, they, they don't think about, well, when you wanna turn that into money, what do you have to do? Like he's got the actual silver bars. Um, and, and so, you know, they're not super liquid. They're, they're volatile because now we have these 20 year olds emotionally trading on them. And again, we just come back to the 10% rule. And I think, you know, a lot of people in this room probably love their tinkering with their investment portfolio. It's super fun to look at these companies and to make the guesses. And a lot of our clients, clients have what I call their mad money account. So you've got your traditional, you're diversified, you have your allocation set up, and then you have an amount of money that you're okay losing. This is not make or break money for me, but hey, if I win, I'll take a vacation. That's in a separate account, and I think it's really fun to continue to play with that stuff. And you might have a good time in crypto or gold and silver because they're becoming more and more volatile. Commodities. So what's a commodity? Timber, oil, gas. Cotton. Rains, cotton. Coffee. 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 Oh, right. Best right. one, coffee. Those things will track inflation, and you'll see there are, there are exchange-traded funds or mutual funds that track those. They've done really well this year. If you think inflation is going to go higher, you can put a percentage of your money in those. I wouldn't do more than like 3% you know, in those things because they tend to be really, really volatile. Yep. And then owning companies that are stable and profitable. This is something you can do during this time because if you're really conservative, you want companies that can still make have their profits go up or maintain their profits during a recession. So those are typically consumer staples. Yeah. So like, you know, we're talking about Heinz and Procter & Gamble, things like that, that are stable companies. People are still gonna buy Pampers diapers, you know, and things like that. Toilet or paper in a toilet pandemic, paper. remember that? Yeah, remember that? Yeah, There's, they still wanted to buy all that stuff. Healthcare also. But that's gonna that's gonna go on. We need we need our healthcare no matter what the economy's doing. And utilities typically tend to hold their value during recessions because they're making money. Um, however, they do they are very interest sensitive. So as rates are going up, they're not they're not doing so well. So that that is a kind of a something to keep a, keep in in mind. Value stocks typically beat growth stocks, especially during periods like now. And we have a chart that shows you uh, going back for almost a hundred years. Uh, the S&P 500 is uh, that, middle, that middle red bar, and it's averaged about 10.5% per year. But value stocks, which are the ones that are selling at a cheaper price, have averaged about a percent and a half higher returns. Now, over 100 years, that is a lot of money. And growth stocks, which would be more things like Tesla, Netflix, uh, Facebook, which is now Meta, yeah. those stocks even though they're the darlings and everybody gets all hyped up about them and they have big flutters in their hearts and everything, over the long run, they don't do as well as the average stock market because people pay too much for them. They pay a really high price. Their earnings, the price earnings ratio is really high. So you want to tilt towards value. The same thing happens in small caps. Small caps have averaged the, the middle uh, purple bar there about 11 and three quarters over the last 90 years, which is about a percent and a quarter higher than the S&P 500. And then if you go into value, you gain a one and a half more percent. And then if you go into growth, it's even worse. You lose two and a half percent. So, you know, value ends up being a better investment over the long run, but it's boring because, you know, it's not, it's not exciting. It's not sexy. It's not like being at the casino. You know, they're just, you're just kind of like watching corn grow. But over the long run, 
You know, keep getting base hits, base hits, base hits. The tortoise beats the hare. Mm -hmm. And that's what this, these charts are showing us. But they're not fun, you know, but the tortoise beats the hare. You want it to be boring, like we were talking, like you had the great analogy, right? Well, no, I was just saying this morning, good investing is really dull. Like for the most part, there's not a lot happening every day. You're not on CNBC with your charts and you're not, ah, we gotta do this, we gotta trade. Like the guys you see on the news, you know, they're all excited all the time. Yeah. But the reality is it's super dull and boring. It's like <laughs> and being in a good marriage. <laughs> you know, but it's just stable. It's good. It works. You know, it's just, yeah. it's just doing well. This is also the Warren Buffett approach. He, does, I don't know that I've ever heard him call it value over growth. That's what he is. Though. But he's taking companies that are undervalued for one reason or another and buying them. Good companies at a low price. Yeah. He says. Yeah. Well, it worked for yeah. him. We'll take it. Uh, okay. So last piece of good news for you i'm sure you all know this already but your social security checks are going to increase by 8.7 percent next year so little thing the government is doing to help us at the grocery store on our steaks and our it's not really a raise though because all you're going to do is keep up with the way the cost of living have gone up so you'll be kind of even with a year ago mm -hmm.